Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, through your spirit, open the eyes of our heart because we know that we're spiritually bankrupt on our own. Lord, when we struggle in our faith, when we turn in other direction, when we get frustrated with that, turn us to Jesus. Help us to realize that it is in Him and Him alone that we find forgiveness, that we find faith, and that we find life, real life, that lasts forever. Thank you for calling us out of bankruptcy and into the riches of faith in you. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I have tremendous respect for people who are able to run marathons. Now, I have been told that roughly mile 17 or so, many runners begin to shut down. They think to themselves, how am I going to go another nine, or in this case, seven miles? I don't think I can take another step. This point in the race, and this picture actually shows it quite well, is called hitting the wall. You feel like you just cannot go another step. Now, I think this analogy of hitting the wall really speaks to a lot of different things in life as well. Some of you here this morning may be hitting your own personal wall. The stress of trying to figure out your kids' schedules, especially with school starting at least here on Tuesday. Struggles ongoing with your own health. A relationship that's badly broken. When we hit the wall like that, we just want to be done with things. I have to imagine that the crowd that was sitting at Jesus' feet as he shared this Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5 through 7 just about had to be hit in the wall by the time we get to Matthew 7. Jesus had been pouring out challenge after challenge after challenge. Well, today he offers three more challenges, and they're, they're warnings of a sort that culminate in this call to live out the golden rule. And on the surface, it just is totally overwhelming. If you're thinking, wait a minute, I cannot do what Jesus is asking of me in this sermon of his, let's be honest, you're right. Jesus is showing us our personal, spiritual bankruptcy. But there's good news. He invites us to find our hope and joy in Him, and to find energy and fuel to keep stepping through the wall that comes from His grace. Jesus wants our personal bankruptcy, spiritual bankruptcy, to be turned and used for His glory. But before we get there, I'd like to take us to a place that's probably familiar to many of us, airport terminals. Now, I will admit, I actually kind of enjoy watching people there. It doesn't take too long, now listen to what I'm saying here, before I see people who in my opinion look a little strange. <laughs> they do things differently, you might even wonder, what in the world is wrong with these people? Why can't they be normal like me? And that's exactly what Jesus is warning us against in the first few verses of Matthew 7. Jesus is saying, be careful when you judge, because when you judge, you quickly devalue another person. It's mighty easy to become critical or condemning when you look at or talk about other people. In fact, we heard in Matthew 7, Jesus told us that the standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. That's kind of frightening if you think about God's standard. What is his standard? Perfection. And we're spiritually bankrupt when it comes to living perfectly. We can't do it. We're not to judge others by looking down on them. But in sharp contrast to that, humility is our ability to see our own personal brokenness and our failures. 
It's the ability to walk alongside others so that they can become more like Jesus. When we have a humble, not judgmental attitude, it actually allows us to walk right with that person and help them along. Jesus then continues with an interesting set of words. He talks about taking a log out of your own eyes before we take a speck out of our friend's eyes. Now, what's interesting here is that Jesus does not say, oh, there's not a speck in your brother's eye, and that you shouldn't try to take that speck out. He's much more concerned with where your heart is as you do this. Take the log out of your own eye, the one that's the hardest to see. Then you can see and admit that, like Matthew 5 told us, that we are broken. We're humble. We need Jesus. With that humility in our heart, you can be able to see well enough where you can lovingly work with your neighbor to remove that speck. Let's think of King David for an example of this. He, the youngest and least likely of all of his other seven brothers to be the next king, was chosen to follow King Saul, a king who was a disaster. But as the prophet Samuel looks at him, he says, the Lord says, do not look at his outward appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. And David's heart was pointed where God wanted it to be. But he also had his problems. While his men, David's men, were off fighting the war, he said, well, I'm just going to stay home. That's a problem. Because as a leader, he needs to be right there with his fighting soldiers. And that showed up, and one day he got a little bored. Yes, he's looking out on his rooftop, which is near one of the highest points in the city of Jerusalem. He sees this beautiful woman by the name of Bathsheba, who's bathing. He desired to have her, and because he's the king, well, he just took her, and he slept with her. Well, come to find out, she's now pregnant. So David calls her husband home from the battle lines, hoping that, well, he'll sleep with her and he'll think the baby's his. But the soldier's a man of integrity. During a war, a soldier usually doesn't sleep with his wife. So David sends him back to the very front and center of the battle lines, and he's killed. All that was an attempt to cover his sin. Now, the prophet Nathan was told by God, here's what's going on. How would you like to bend in his shoes? He comes to David with this story of a rich man and a poor man. The rich man had all kinds of sheep, animals, and wealth. The poor man had a single ewe lamb that he had raised from birth. He loved that lamb like it was his own child. But the rich man just takes the lamb from the poor man. And David is furious. He says, that man needs to be punished. Nathan then looks David straight in the eyes and tells him, you are the man. You ripped that poor little lamb from Bathsheba, from, from the poor man with Bathsheba, excuse me. And in that moment, David doesn't try to cover it up. He doesn't try to make an excuse. He simply says, I have sinned against the Lord. He confesses. He repents for what he did. And God in his mercy forgave him. The second warning, I think this is the trickiest one that God gives us, is not to be indiscriminate with the truth, or put another way, not to waste things that are holy on those who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs was the example. This is kind of a tricky one, because they will trample the pearls, turn, and attack you. The pearls of the gospel are precious. We handle them with care. Now we see this clearly in the ministry of Jesus. He goes before the religious elite and he shares the pearls of the gospel. What do they do with them? They not only trample him and take them, they hang him on a cross. Instead, it's the unexpected ones, the social outcasts, the sick, the poor listen and love that gospel message. It radically changed their lives. 
What Jesus is saying here, and you have to be careful with this, is to be careful with how you handle the truth. We're not to throw it before the person that says, you know what, only God, if he even exists, can judge me, and no one else. No one can call me on what I'm doing. You see, we're to hold the gospel truly carefully as we do reach out to folks. Jesus changes gears. He gives us a third warning. Do not depend on yourself. Instead, we are invited to return to the Lord. Jesus put it this way, and I shared this in the children's message. Ask, or actually it's a continuing action, so keep on asking, and it will be given to you. Keep on seeking, and you will find, and keep on knocking, and it will be opened unto you. Each of these, as I mentioned, is a continuing action. They're not one-time, one-shot only events. Jesus invites us to come to him in humility, persistently seeking, and to come to him in prayer when we hit that wall. Depend on the Lord and His grace that it would be unleashed in our lives. Now, as we worked our way through Matthew 5 through 7, if we attempt to live out the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount on our own strength, you're very quickly going to fizzle out and smack into that wall. Jesus is not a genie. You don't rub the lamp and immediately get a new car. But as we go to Jesus... You receive all the other things that he's talking about in this message ever preached, the greatest one. It's things like humility, recognition of our own weakness, the strength to be a peacemaker, and going into the world in meekness, and we put the needs of others above our own. In order to live that out, Jesus is saying, you can't do that yourself. Instead, we return to him over and over again. Jesus says, I'm your only hope in a broken, messy world. You can trust me. Or as Jesus put it, if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? We see how trustworthy our Heavenly Father is as we look up and we see our Savior Jesus hanging there on the cross. We look to the tomb where he was laid because it's empty. He defeated sin, death, and the devil on our behalf. The Holy Spirit has been given to us. The Holy Spirit gives us those good gifts we need over and over again. They're offered to us as Jesus and the Spirit work in us. Simply put, our entrance into God's kingdom is entirely dependent on God's grace. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit is a recognition of our spiritual bankruptcy, our sinfulness, and a need for a Savior to walk into our life. And as we heard, as Jesus raises the bar over and over again in this Sermon on the Mount, as we talk about becoming more like Jesus, it's entirely dependent that we see it's on His grace. And we see that, in summary, as He gives us the golden rule. Do unto others what you would have them do to you. For that sums up the law and the prophets. You see, the golden rule ultimately points us to Jesus. Every other faith system, every other religion has a golden rule, but it's always put in negative terms. If you don't want to have something done to you, well then don't do it. But Jesus puts it in a positive way. Do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. Now the only way we can fulfill this is to have a relationship with the one who has already fulfilled it, to literally walk with Jesus. If you want to love your neighbor as yourself, we see the love that Jesus has for us. If you desire a heart that's not judgmental, but is humble and can see its own brokenness, so you can help others grow in faith, we look and see what Jesus did for us. 
If you want to see the vulnerableness and the brokenness in others, we first see it in ourselves. Jesus is the only one who has fulfilled everything in the law and the prophets. There was an overwhelming distance between the demands of Jesus in our own lives, and it shows us our personal spiritual bankruptcy. But isn't it amazing that out of our bankruptcy and brokenness, God wants to change the world for His glory? So if you feel yourself hitting the wall, maybe that's not a sign to dig deeper, to try harder, to add another layer of rules in your life. Rather, it's an invitation to find your rest entirely in the one who fulfilled the law and the prophets, Jesus. Jesus alone. That is how God uses broken and sinful people, people like Nathan, like you, like me, to bring change into this world. Take a deep breath. Sermon on the Mount just sounds overwhelming. And it should, because that points us back to Jesus and his unconditional response of love for you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all of our human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.